Section 14 of Folklore and Legends English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica Juan Choi, Seoul, www.studentsocial.blogspot.kr. Folklore and Legends English by Charles John Tibbetts. The Fairy Children. Another wonderful thing, says Ralph of Cogshall, happened in Suffolk at St. Mary's of the Wolf Pits. A boy and a sister were found by the inhabitants of that place, near the mouth of a pit which is there, who had the form of all their limbs like to those of other men, but they were different in the color of their skin from all the people of our habitable world, for the whole surface of their skin was tinged of a green color. No one could understand their speech. When they were brought as curiosities to the house of a certain knight, Sir Richard de Calnet Wykes, they wept bitterly. Bread and victuals were set before them, but they would touch none of them, though they were tormented by great hunger, as the girl afterwards acknowledged. At length, when some beans just cut with their stalks were brought into the house, they made signs with great avidity that they should be given to them. When they were brought, they opened the stalks instead of the pods, thinking the beans were in the hollow of them, but not finding them there, they began to weep anew. When those who were present saw this, they opened the pods and showed them the naked beans. They fed on these with great delight, and for a long time tasted no other food. The boy, however, was always languid and depressed, and he died within a short time. The girl enjoyed continual good health, and becoming accustomed to various kinds of food, lost completely that green color and gradually recovered the sanguine habit of her entire body. She was afterwards regenerated by the labor of holy baptism, and lived for many years in the service of that knight, as I have frequently heard from him and his family. Being frequently asked about the people of her country, she asserted that the inhabitants and all they had in that country were of a green color, and that they saw no sun, but enjoyed a degree of light like what is after sunset. Being asked how she came into this country with the aforesaid boy, she replied that as they were following their flocks, they came to a certain cavern, on entering which they heard a delightful sound of bells, ravished by whose sweetness they went on for a long time, wandering on through the cavern until they came to its mouth. When they came out of it, they were struck senseless by the excessive light of the sun and the unusual temperature of the air, and they thus lay for a long time. Being terrified by the noise of those who came on them, they wished to fly, but they could not find the entrance of the cavern before they were caught. This story is also told by William of Newbury, who places it in the reign of King Stephen. He says he long hesitated to believe it, but was at length overcome by the weight of evidence. According to him, the place where the children appeared was about four or five miles from Barry St. Edmunds. They came in harvest time out of the wolf pits. They both lost their green hue and were baptized and learned English. The boy, who was the younger, died, but the girl married a man at Lena and lived many years. They said their country was called St. Martin's Land, as that saint was chiefly worshipped there that the people were Christians and had churches, that the sun did not rise there, but that there was a bright country which could be seen from theirs, being divided from it by a very broad river. End of section 14. Recording by Jessica Juan Choi, Seoul, www.studentsocial.blogspot.kr Section 15. A Folklore and Legends, English this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbetts. Section 15. The History of Jack and the Beanstalk. From a chapbook printed at Paisley by G. Caldwell, bookseller. Probable date, 1810. In the days of King Alfred, there lived a poor woman whose cottage was situated in a remote country village, a great many miles from London. She had been a widow some years, and had an only child named Jack, whom she indulged to a fault. The consequence of her blind partiality was that Jack did not pay the least attention to anything she said, but was indolent careless and extravagant. His follies were not owing to a bad disposition, but that his mother had never checked him. By degrees she disposed of all she possessed. Scarcely anything remained but a cow. The poor woman one day met Jack with tears in her eyes. 
Her distress was great, and for the first time in her life she could not help reproaching him, saying, "'Oh, you wicked child! By your ungrateful course of life you have at last brought me to beggary and ruin! Cruel, cruel boy! I have not money enough to purchase even a bit of bread for another day. Nothing now remains to sell but my poor cow. I am sorry to part with her. It grieves me sadly, but we must not starve.' For a few minutes Jack felt a degree of remorse, but it was soon over, and he began teasing his mother to let him sell the cow at the next village so much that she at last consented. As he was going along he met a butcher, who inquired why he was driving the cow from home. Jack replied he was going to sell it. The butcher held some curious beans in his hat that were of various colors and attracted Jack's notice. This had not passed unnoticed by the butcher, who, knowing Jack's easy temper, thought now was the time to take advantage of it, and determined not to let slip so good an opportunity, asked what was the price of the cow, offering at the same time all the beans in his hat for her. The silly boy could not conceal the pleasure he felt at what he supposed so great an offer. The bargain was struck instantly, and the cow exchanged for a few paltry beans. Jack made the best of his way home, calling aloud to his mother before he reached the house, thinking to surprise her. When she saw the beans and heard Jack's account, her patience quite forsook her. She kicked the beans away in a passion. They flew in all directions. Some were scattered in the garden. Not having anything to eat, they both went supperless to bed. Jack awoke very early in the morning and seeing something uncommon from the window of his bedchamber, ran downstairs into the garden, where he soon discovered that some of the beans had taken root and sprung up surprisingly. The stalks were of an immense thickness, and had so entwined that they formed a ladder nearly like a chain in appearance. Looking upwards, he could not discern the top. It appeared to be lost in the clouds. He tried the stalk, found it firm and not to be shaken. He quickly formed the resolution of endeavouring to climb up to the top in order to seek his fortune, and ran to communicate his intention to his mother, not doubting but she would be equally pleased with himself. She declared he should not go, said it would break her heart if he did, entreated and threatened, but all in vain. Jack set out, and after climbing for some hours, reached the top of the beanstalk, fatigued and quite exhausted. Looking around, he found himself in a strange country. It appeared to be a desert, quite barren, not a tree, shrub, house, or living creature to be seen. Here and there were scattered fragments of stone, and at unequal distances small heaps of earth were loosely thrown together. Jack seated himself, pensively, upon a block of stone, and thought of his mother. He reflected with sorrow on his disobedience in climbing the beanstalk against her will and concluded that he must die of hunger. However, he walked on, hoping to see a house where he might beg something to eat and drink. Presently, a handsome young woman appeared at a distance. As she approached, Jack could not help admiring how beautiful and lively she looked. She was dressed in the most elegant manner, and had a small white wand in her hand, on the top of which was a peacock of pure gold. While Jack was looking, with the greatest surprise, at this charming female, she came up to him, and with a smile the most bewitching sweetness, inquired how he came there. Jack related the circumstance of the beanstalk. She asked him if he recollected his father. He replied he did not, and added there must be some mystery relating to him, because if he asked his mother who his father was, she always burst into tears and appeared to be violently agitated nor did she recover herself for some days after. One thing, however, he could not avoid observing on these occasions, which was that she always carefully avoided answering him, and even seemed afraid of speaking, as if there were some secret connected with his father's history which he must not disclose. The young woman replied, I will reveal the whole story. Your mother must not do so. But before I begin, I require a solemn promise on your part to do what I command. 
I am a fairy, and if you do not perform exactly what I desire, you will be destroyed. Jack was frightened at her menaces, and promised to fulfill her injunctions exactly, and the fairy thus addressed him. Your father was a rich man. His disposition was very benevolent. He was very good to the poor, and constantly relieved them. He made it a rule never to let a day pass without doing good to some person. On one particular day in the week he kept open house, and invited all those who were reduced and had lived well. He always presided himself, and did all in his power to render his guests comfortable. The rich and the great were next invited. The servants were all happy and greatly attached to their master and mistress. Your father, though only a private gentleman, was as rich as a prince, and he deserved all he possessed, for he only lived to do good. Such a man was soon known and talked of. A giant lived a great many miles off. This man was altogether as wicked as your father was good. He was, in his heart, envious, covetous, and cruel, but he had the art of concealing those vices. He was poor, and wished to enrich himself at any rate. Hearing your father spoken of, he formed a design of becoming acquainted with him, hoping to ingratiate himself into your father's favor. He removed quickly into your neighborhood, and caused it to be reported that he was a gentleman who had just lost all he possessed by an earthquake, and had found it difficult to escape with his life. His wife was with him. Your father gave credit to his story and pitied him. He gave him handsome apartments in his own house, and caused him and his wife to be treated like visitors of consequence, little imagining that the giant was undertaking a horrid return for all his favors. Things went on this way for some time, the giant becoming daily more impatient to put his plan in execution. At last, a favorable opportunity presented itself. Your father's house was at some distance from the seashore, but with a glass the coast could be seen distinctly. The giant was one day using the telescope. The wind was very high, and he saw a fleet of ships in distress off the rocks. He hastened to your father, mentioned the circumstance, and eagerly requested he would send all the servants he could spare to relieve the sufferers. Everyone was instantly dispatched, except the porter and your nurse. The giant then joined your father in the study, and appeared to be delighted. He really was so. Your father recommended a favorite book, and was handing it down, when the giant, taking the opportunity, stabbed him, and he instantly fell down dead. The giant left the body, found the porter and nurse, and presently dispatched them, being determined to have no living witnesses of his crimes. You were then only three months old. Your mother had you in her arms in a remote part of the house, and was ignorant of what was going on. She went into the study, but how was she shocked on discovering your father dead? She was stupefied with horror and grief, and was motionless. The giant, who was seeking her, found her in that state, and hastened to serve her and you as he had done your father, but she fell at his feet, and, in a pathetic manner, besought him to spare her life and yours. Remorse, for a moment, seemed to touch the barbarian's heart. He granted your lives, but first he made her take a most solemn oath never to inform you who your father was, or to answer any questions concerning him, assuring her that if she did, he would certainly discover her and put both of you to death in the most cruel manner. Your mother took you in her arms and fled as quickly as possible. She was scarcely gone when the giant repented he had suffered her to escape. He would have pursued her instantly, but he had to provide for his own safety, as it was necessary he should be gone before the servants returned. Having gained your father's confidence, he knew where to find all his treasure. He soon loaded himself and his wife, set the house on fire in several places, and when the servants returned, the house was burnt quite down to the ground. Your poor mother, forlorn, abandoned, and forsaken, wandered with you a great many miles from this scene of desolation. Fear added to her haste. She settled in the cottage where you were brought up, 
and it was entirely owing to her fear of the giant that she never mentioned your father to you. I became your father's guardian at his birth, but fairies have laws to which they are subject as well as mortals. A short time before the giant went to your father's, I transgressed. My punishment was a suspension of power for a limited time, an unfortunate circumstance, for it totally prevented my succoring your father. The day on which you met the butcher, as you went to sell your mother's cow, my power was restored. It was I who secretly prompted you to take the beans in exchange for the cow. By my power the beanstalk grew to so great a height and formed a ladder. I need not add, I inspired you with a strong desire to ascend the ladder. The giant lives in this country, and you are the person appointed to punish him for all his wickedness. You will have dangers and difficulties to encounter, but you must persevere in avenging the death of your father, or you will not prosper in any of your undertakings, but be always miserable. As to the giant's possessions, you may seize on all you can, for everything he has is yours, though now you are unjustly deprived of it. One thing I desire. Do not let your mother know you are acquainted with your father's history till you see me again. Go along the direct road, and you will soon see the house where your cruel enemy lives. While you do as I order you, I will protect and guard you. But remember, if you dare disobey my commands, a most dreadful punishment awaits you. When the fairy had concluded, she disappeared, leaving Jack to pursue his journey. He walked on till after sunset, when, to his great joy, he espied a large mansion. This agreeable sight revived his drooping spirits, and he redoubled his speed, and soon reached the house. A plain-looking woman was at the door, and Jack accosted her, begging she would give him a morsel of bread and a night's lodging. She expressed the greatest surprise at seeing him, and said it was quite uncommon to see a human being near their house, for it was well known her husband was a large and very powerful giant, and that he would never eat anything but human flesh if he could possibly get it. That he did not think anything of walking fifty miles to procure it, usually being out the whole day for that purpose. This account greatly terrified Jack, but still he hoped to elude the giant, and therefore he again entreated the woman to take him in for one night only, and hide him where she thought proper. The good woman at last suffered herself to be persuaded, for she was of a compassionate and generous disposition, and took him into the house. First they entered a fine large hall, magnificently furnished. They then passed through several spacious rooms, all in the same style of grandeur, but they appeared to be quite forsaken and desolate. A long gallery was next. It was very dark, with just light enough to show that, instead of a wall, on one side there was a grating of iron which parted off a dismal dungeon, from whence issued the groans of those poor victims whom the cruel giant reserved in confinement for his own voracious appetite. Poor Jack was half dead with fear, and would have given the world to have been with his mother again, for he now began to fear that he should never see her more, and gave himself up for lost. He even mistrusted the good woman, and thought she had let him into the house for no other purpose than to lock him up among the unfortunate people in the dungeon. At the further end of the gallery there was a spacious kitchen, and a very excellent fire was burning in the grate. The good woman bade Jack sit down, and gave him plenty to eat and drink. Jack, not seeing anything here to make him uncomfortable, soon forgot his fear, and was just beginning to enjoy himself when he was aroused by a loud knocking at the street door, which made the whole house shake. The giant's wife ran to secure Jack in the oven, and then went to let her husband in. Jack heard him accost her in a voice like thunder, saying, Wife! I smell fresh meat. Oh, my dear, replied she, it is nothing but the people in the dungeon. The giant appeared to believe her, and walked into the very kitchen where poor Jack was concealed, who shook, trembled, and was more terrified than he had yet been. At last the monster seated himself quietly by the fireside, whilst his wife prepared supper. By degrees, Jack recovered himself sufficiently 
to look at the giant through a small crevice. He was quite astonished to see what an amazing quantity he devoured, and thought he would never have done eating and drinking. When supper was ended, the giant desired his wife to bring him his hen. A very beautiful hen was brought and placed on the table before him. Jack's curiosity was very great to see what would happen. He observed that every time the giant said, Lay! The hen laid an egg of solid gold. The giant amused himself a long while with his hen, and meanwhile his wife went to bed. At length the giant fell asleep by the fireside and snored like the roaring of a cannon. At daybreak Jack, finding the giant still asleep and not likely to awaken soon, crept softly out of his hiding place, seized the hen, and ran off with her. He met with some difficulty in finding his way out of the house, but, at last, he reached the road in safety. He easily found his way to the beanstalk, and descended it better and quicker than he had expected. His mother was overjoyed to see him. He found her crying bitterly, and lamenting his hard fate, for she concluded that he had come to some shocking end through his rashness. Jack was impatient to show his hen, and inform his mother how valuable it was. "'And now, mother,' said Jack, "'I have brought home that which will make us rich, and I hope to make some amends for the affliction I have caused you through my idleness, extravagance, and folly.' The hen produced as many golden eggs as they desired, which Jack and his mother sold, and so, in a little time, became possessed of as much riches as they wanted. For some months Jack and his mother lived very happily together, but he, being very desirous of traveling, recollecting the fairy's commands, and fearing that if he delayed she would put her threats into execution, longed to climb the beanstalk and pay the giant another visit, in order to carry away some more of his treasure, for, during the time that Jack was in the giant's mansion, while he lay concealed in the oven, he learned, from the conversation that took place between the giant and his wife, that he possessed some wonderful curiosities. Jack thought of his journey again and again, but still he could not summon resolution enough to break it to his mother, being well assured she would endeavor to prevent his going. However, one day he told her boldly that he must take a journey up the beanstalk. His mother begged and prayed him not to think of it, and tried all in her power to dissuade him. She told him that the giant's wife would certainly know him again, and the giant would desire nothing better than to get him into his power, that he might put him to a cruel death in order to be revenged for the loss of his hen. Jack, finding all his arguments were useless, pretended to give up the point, though he was resolved to go at all events. He had a dress prepared which would disguise him, and something to color his skin, and he thought it impossible for anyone to recollect him in this dress. In a few mornings after this, he rose very early, changed his complexion, and, unperceived by anyone, climbed the beanstalk a second time. He was greatly fatigued when he reached the top, and very hungry. Having rested some time on one of the stones, he pursued his journey to the giant's mansion. He reached it late in the evening and found the woman at the door as before. Jack addressed her, at the same time telling her a pitiful tale, and requesting she would give him some victuals and drink, and also a night's lodging. She told him, what he knew very well before, about her husband's being a powerful and cruel giant, and also how she one night admitted a poor, hungry, friendless boy, who was half dead with traveling, and that the ungrateful fellow had stolen one of the giant's treasures ever since which her husband had been worse than before, had used her very cruelly and continually upbraided her with being the cause of his loss. Jack was at no loss to discover that he was attending to the account of a story in which he was a principal actor. He did his best to persuade the old woman to admit him, but found it a very hard task. At last she consented, and as she led the way, Jack observed that everything was just as he had found it before. She took him into the kitchen, and after he had done eating and drinking, she hid him in an old lumber closet. The giant returned at the usual time, and walked in so heavily that the house was shaken to the foundation. 
he seated himself by the fire, and soon after exclaimed, Wife, I smell fresh meat. The wife replied it was the crows, which had brought a piece of raw meat and left it on top of the house. While supper was preparing, the giant was very ill-tempered and impatient, frequently lifting up his hand to strike his wife for not being quick enough, but she was always so fortunate as to elude the blow. The giant was also continually upbraiding her with the loss of his wonderful hen. The giant's wife, having set supper on the table, went to another apartment and brought from it a huge pie which she also placed before him. When he had ended his plentiful supper and eaten till he was quite satisfied, he said to his wife, I must have something to amuse me, either my bags of money or my harp. After a good deal of ill humor, and after having teased his wife for some time, he commanded her to bring down his bags of gold and silver. Jack, as before, peeped out of his hiding place, and presently the wife brought two bags into the room. They were of a very large size. One was filled with new guineas, and the other with new shillings. They were placed before the giant, who began reprimanding his poor wife most severely for staying so long. She replied, trembling with fear, that they were so heavy she could scarcely lift them, and concluded by saying she would never again bring them downstairs, adding that she had nearly fainted owing to their weight. This so exasperated the giant that he raised his hand to strike her, but she escaped and went to bed, leaving him to count over his treasure by way of amusement. The giant took his bags, and after turning them over and over to see they were in the same state he had left them, began to count their contents. First the bag which contained the silver was emptied, and the contents placed upon the table. Jack viewed the glittering heaps with delight, and most heartily wished them in his own possession. The giant, little thinking he was so narrowly watched, reckoned the silver over several times, and then, having satisfied himself that all was safe, put it into the bags again, which he made very secure. The other bag was opened next, and the guineas placed upon the table. If Jack was pleased at the sight of the silver, how much more delighted must he have felt when he saw such a heap of glittering gold! He even had the boldness to think of gaining both bags, but suddenly recollecting himself, he began to fear that the giant would sham sleep, the better to entrap anyone who might be concealed. When the giant had counted over the gold till he was tired, he put it up, if possible, more secure than he had put up the silver before, and he then fell back on his chair by the fireside and fell asleep. He snored so loud that Jack compared his noise to the roaring of the sea in a high wind when the tide is coming in. At last Jack concluded him to be asleep and therefore secure. He stole out of his hiding place and approached the giant in order to carry off the two bags of money. Just as he laid his hand upon one of the bags, a little dog, which he had not observed before, started from under the giant's chair and barked at Jack most furiously, who now gave himself up for lost. Fear riveted him to the spot, and instead of endeavoring to escape, he stood still, though expecting his enemy to awake every instant. Contrary, however, to his expectation, the giant continued in a sound sleep, and the dog grew wary of barking. Jack now began to recollect himself, and on looking around saw a large piece of meat. This he threw to the dog, who instantly seized it, and took it into the lumber closet which Jack had just left. Finding himself delivered from a noisy and troublesome enemy, and seeing the giant did not awake, Jack boldly seized the bags, and throwing them over his shoulders, ran out of the kitchen. He reached the street door in safety, and found it quite daylight. On his way to the top of the beanstalk, he found himself greatly incommoded with the weight of the money bags, and really, they were so heavy he could scarcely carry them. Jack was overjoyed when he found himself near the beanstalk. He soon reached the bottom and ran to meet his mother. To his great surprise, the cottage was deserted. He ran from one room to another without being able to find anyone. He then hastened into the village, hoping to see some of his neighbors 
who could inform him where he could find her. An old woman at last directed him to a neighboring house where his mother was ill of a fever. He was greatly shocked on finding her apparently dying, and could scarcely bear his own reflections on knowing himself to be the cause of it. On being informed of our hero's safe return, his mother by degrees revived, and gradually recovered. Jack presented her his two valuable bags, and they lived happily and comfortably. The cottage was rebuilt and well furnished. For three years Jack heard no more of the beanstalk, but he could not forget it, though he feared making his mother unhappy. She would not mention the hated beanstalk, lest her doing so should remind him of taking another journey. Notwithstanding the comforts Jack enjoyed at home, his mind continually dwelt upon the beanstalk, for the fairy's menaces in case of his disobedience were ever present to his mind and prevented him from being happy. He could think of nothing else. It was in vain he endeavored to amuse himself. He became thoughtful, would arise at the first dawn of day, and would view the beanstalk for hours together. His mother discovered that something preyed heavily upon his mind and endeavored to discover the cause. But Jack knew too well what the consequence would be should he discover the cause of his melancholy to her. He did his utmost, therefore, to conquer the great desire he had for another journey of the beanstalk. Finding, however, that his inclination grew too powerful for him, he began to make secret preparations for his journey, and on the longest day arose as soon as it was light, ascended the beanstalk, and reached the top with some little trouble. He found the road, journey, etc., much as it was on the two former times. He arrived at the giant's mansion in the evening, and found his wife standing, as usual, at the door. Jack had disguised himself so completely that she did not appear to have the least recollection of him. However, when he pleaded hunger and poverty in order to gain admittance, he found it very difficult indeed to persuade her. At last he prevailed, and was concealed in the copper. When the giant returned, he said, I smell fresh meat. But Jack felt composed, for the giant had said so before, and had been soon satisfied. However, the giant started up suddenly, and searched all around the room. Whilst this was going forward, Jack was exceedingly terrified, and ready to die with fear, wishing himself at home a thousand times. But when the giant approached the copper, and put his hand upon the lid, Jack thought his death was certain. The giant ended his search there without moving the lid, and seated himself quietly by the fireside. The giant at last ate a hearty supper, and when he had finished, he commanded his wife to fetch down his harp. Jack peeped under the copper lid, and soon saw the most beautiful harp that could be imagined. It was placed by the giant on the table, who said, Play! and it instantly played of its own accord, without being touched. The music was uncommonly fine. Jack was delighted, and felt more anxious to get the harp into his possession than either of the former treasures. The giant's soul was not attuned to harmony, and the music soon lulled him into a sound sleep. Now, therefore, was the time to carry off the harp. As the giant appeared to be in a more profound sleep than usual, Jack, soon determined, got out of the copper and seized the harp. The harp, however, was enchanted by a fairy, and it called out loudly, Master! Master! The giant awoke, stood up, and tried to pursue Jack, but he had drunk so much that he could hardly stand. Poor Jack ran as fast as he could, and in a little time the giant recovered sufficiently to walk slowly, or rather, to reel after him. Had he been sober, he must have overtaken Jack instantly, but as he then was, Jack contrived to be first at the top of the beanstalk. The giant called after him in a voice like thunder, and sometimes was very near him. The moment Jack got down the beanstalk, he called out for a hatchet, and one was brought him directly. Just at that instant, the giant was beginning to descend, but Jack, with his hatchet, cut the beanstalk close off at the root which made the giant fall headlong into the garden. The fall killed him, thereby releasing the world from a barbarous enemy. Jack's mother was delighted when she saw the beanstalk destroyed, 
At this instant, the fairy appeared. She first addressed Jack's mother and explained every circumstance relating to the journeys up the beanstalk. The fairy then charged Jack to be dutiful to his mother and to follow his father's good example, which was the only way to be happy. She then disappeared. Jack heartily begged his mother's pardon for all the sorrow and affliction he had caused her, promising most faithfully to be very dutiful and obedient to her for the future. End of section 15、section、16 of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Parsons. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. Johnny Reed's Cat. Yes, cats are queer folk, sure enough, and often no more than a simple beast ought to by knowledge that's rightly come by. There's that cat there you've been looking at, will stand at a door on its hind legs with its front paws on the handle, trying like a Christian to open the door and mewling in a manner that's almost like talking. He's a London cat, he is, being brought me by a cousin who lives there and is called Gilpin after, I'm told, a mayor who was christened the same. He's a knowing cat, sure enough, but it's not the London cats that are cleverer than the country ones. Who knows, he may be a relative of Johnny Reed's own tomcat himself. And who was Johnny Reed, and what was there remarkable about his cat? Have you never heard tell of Johnny Reed's cat? It's an old tale they have in the North Country, and it's true enough, though folk may not believe it in these days, when the Bible's not gospel enough for some of them. I've heard my father often tell the story, and he came from Newcastle Way, which is the very part where Johnny Reed used to live, being a parish sexton in a village not far away. Well, Johnny Reed was the sexton, as I've already said, and he and his wife kept a cat, a well enough behaved creature, sure enough, and a beast as he had no fault to set on, saving a few of the tricks which all cats play at times, and which seem born in the blood of the creatures. It was all black except one white paw, and seemed as honest and decent a beast as could be. And Tom would as soon have suspected it of being any more than it really seemed to be as he would one of his own children themselves, like many other folk perhaps who, maybe, have cats of the same kind, little thinking it. Well, the cat had been with him some years when a strange thing occurred. One night, Johnny was going home late from the churchyard, where he had been digging a grave for a person who had died on a sudden, throwing the grave on Johnny's hands unexpectedly, so that he had to stop working at it by the light of a lantern to have it ready for the next day's burying. Well, having finished his work, and having put his tools in the shed in a corner of the yard, and having locked them up safe, he began to walk home pretty brisk, thinking would his wife be up and have a bit of fire for him, for the night was cold, a keen wind blowing over the fields. He hadn't gone far before he comes to a gate at the roadside, and there seemed to be a strange shadow about it, in which Johnny saw, as it might be, a lot of little gleaming fires dancing about, while some stood steady, just like flashes of light from little windows in buildings all on fire inside. Says Johnny to himself, for he was not a man to be easily frightened, being accustomed by his calling to face things which might upset other folk. Hello, what's here? Here's a thing I've never saw before. And with that, he walks straight up to the gate, while the shadow got deeper and the fires brighter the nearer he came to it. Well, when he came right up to the gate, he finds that the shadow was just none at all but nine black cats, some sitting and some dancing about, and the lights were the flashes from their eyes. 
when he came nearer he thought to scare them off and he calls out sh 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 but never a cat stirs for all of it i'll soon scatter you you ugly varmin says johnny looking about him for a stone which was not to be found the night being dark and preventing him seeing one just then he hears a voice calling johnny reed hello says he who's that wants me johnny reed says the voice again well says johnny i'm here and looking round and seeing no one for no one was about tis true was it one of you says he joking like to the cats as was calling me yes of course answers one of them as plain as ever christian spoke it's me as has called you these three times well with that you may be sure johnny begins to feel curious for twas the first time he had ever been spoken to by a cat and he didn't know what it might lead to exactly so he takes off his hat to the cat thinking that it was perhaps best to show it respect and seeing that he was unable to guess with whom he was dealing hoping to come off all the better for a little civility well sir says he what can i do for you it's not much as i want with you says the cat but it's better it'll be with you if you do what i tell you tell dan radcliffe that peggy poison's dead i will sir says johnny wondering at the same time how he was to do it for who dan radcliffe was he knew no more than the dead well with that all the cats vanished and johnny running the rest of the way home rushes into his house smoking hot from the fright and the distance he had to go over nan says he to his wife the first words he spoke who's dan radcliffe dan radcliffe says she i never heard of him and don't know there's any one such living about here no more do i says he but i must find him wherever he is then he tells his wife all about how he had met the cats and how they had stopped him and given him the message well his cat sits there in front of the fire looking as snug and comfortable as a cat could be and nearly half asleep but when johnny comes to telling his wife the message the cats had given him then it jumped up on its feet and looks at johnny and says what is peggy poison dead then it's no time for me to be here and with that it springs through the door and vanishes nor was ever seen again from that day to this and did the sexton ever find dan radcliffe i asked never he searched high and low for him about but no one could tell him of such a person though johnny looked long enough thinking it might be the worse for him if he didn't do his best to please the cats at last however he gave the matter up then what was the meaning of the cat's message it's hard to tell but many folk thought and i'm inclined to agree with them that dan radcliffe was johnny's own cat and no one else looking at the way he acted and no other of the name being known who peggy poison was no one could tell but likely enough it was some relative of the cat or maybe some one it was interested in for it's little we know concerning the creatures and their ways and with whom and what they're mixed up end of section sixteen Section 17 of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Parsons. Folklore and Legends, English by Charles John Tibbets. Lame Molly. 
two devonshire serving-maids declared as an excuse perhaps for spending more money than they ought upon finery that the pixies were very kind to them and would often drop silver for their pleasure into a bucket of fair water which they placed for the accommodation of those little beings every night in the chimney-corner before they went to bed once however it was forgotten and the pixies finding themselves disappointed by an empty bucket whisked upstairs to the maid's bedroom popped through the keyhole and began in a very audible tone to exclaim against the laziness and neglect of the damsels one of them who lay awake and heard all this jogged her fellow-servant and proposed getting up immediately to repair the fault of omission but the lazy girl who liked not being disturbed out of a comfortable nap pettishly declared that for her part she would not stir out of bed to please all the pixies in devonshire the good-humoured damsel however got up filled the bucket and was rewarded by a handful of silver pennies found in it the next morning but ere that time had arrived what was her alarm as she crept towards the bed to hear all the elves in high and stern debate consulting as to what punishment should be inflicted on the lazy lass who would not stir for their pleasure some proposed pinches nips and bobs others to spoil her new cherry-coloured bonnet and ribbons one talked of sending her the toothache another of giving her a red nose but this last was voted too severe and vindictive a punishment for a pretty young woman so tempering mercy with justice the pixies were kind enough to let her off with a lame leg which was so to continue only for seven years and was alone to be cured by a certain herb growing on dartmoor whose long and learned and very difficult name the elfin judge pronounced in a high and audible voice it was a name of seven syllables seven being also the number of years decreed for the chastisement the good-natured maid wishing to save her fellow damsel so long a suffering tried with might and main to bear in mind the name of this potent herb she said it over and over again tied a knot in her garter at every syllable in order to assist her memory and thought she had the word as sure as her own name and very possibly felt much more anxious about retaining the one than the other at length she dropped asleep and did not wake till the morning now whether her head might be like a sieve that lets out as fast as it takes in or whether the over-exertion to remember caused her to forget cannot be determined but certain it is when she opened her eyes she knew nothing at all about the matter excepting that molly was to go lame on her right leg for seven long years unless an herb with a strange name could be got to cure her and lame she went for nearly the whole of that period at length it was about the end of the time a merry squint-eyed queer-looking boy started up one fine summer day just as she went to pluck a mushroom and came tumbling head over heels towards her he insisted on striking her leg with a plant which he held in his hand from that moment she got well and lame molly as a reward for her patience in suffering became the best dancer in the whole town at the celebrated festivities of may day on the green end of section seventeen section eighteen of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Paul Arnold. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. The Brown Man of the Moors. In the year before the Great Rebellion, two young men from Newcastle were sporting on the high moors above Elston, and after pursuing their game several hours, sat down to dine in a green glen near one of the mountain streams. After their repast, the younger lad ran to the brook for water, and after stooping to drink was surprised, on lifting his head again, by the appearance of a brown dwarf who stood on a crag covered with brackens across the burn. 
This extraordinary personage did not appear to be above half the stature of a common man, but was uncommonly stout and broad-built, having the appearance of vast strength. His dress was entirely brown, the colour of the brackens, and his head covered with frizzled red hair. His countenance was expressive of the most savage ferocity, and his eyes glared like those of a bull. It seemed he addressed the young man, first threatening him with his vengeance for having trespassed on his demesnes, and asked him if he knew in whose presence he stood. The youth replied that he supposed him to be the lord of the moors, that he defended through ignorance, and offered to bring him the game he'd killed. The dwarf was a little mollified by this submission, but remarked that nothing could be more offensive to him than such an offer, and he considered the wild animals his subjects, and he never failed to avenge their destruction. He condescended further to inform the young man that he was, like himself, mortal, though of years far exceeding the lot of common humanity, and he hoped for salvation. He never, he added, fed on anything that had life, but lived in the summer on wattleberries, and in winter on nuts and apples, of which he had a great store in the woods. Finally, he invited his new acquaintance to accompany him home and partake his hospitality, an offer which the youth, on the point of accepting, was just going to spring across the brook, which, if he had done, the dwarf would certainly have torn him to pieces, when his foot was arrested by the voice of his companion, who thought he'd tarried long. On his looking round again, the wee brown man was fled. The story adds that the young man was imprudent enough to slight the admonition, and to sport over the moors on his way homewards that soon after his return he fell into a lingering disorder and died within a year. End of section 18。section 19 of folklore and legends English。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit。LibriVox.org。recording by Jonathan Paul Arnold。Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. How the Cobbler Cheated the Devil It chanced that once upon a time, long years ago, in the days when strange things used to happen in the world, and the devil himself used to sometimes walk about in a very barefaced fashion, to the distraction of all good and bad folk alike, he came to a very small town where he resolved to stay a while, to play some of his tricks. How it was, whether the people were better or were worse than he expected to find them, whether they would not give way to him, or whether they went beyond him and outwitted him, I don't know, so cannot say. But sure it is that a short while he became terribly angry with the folk, and at length was so disgusted that he threatened he would make them repent their treatment of him, for he would punish them in a manner which should show them his power. With that he flew off in a fury, and the folk, knowing with whom they had to deal, were very sad thinking what terrible thing would overtake them and at their wit's end to imagine how they might manage to escape the claws of the evil one. Accordingly, it was decided to call a meeting of the townsfolk, to which all, old and young, should come to deliver their opinion as to the best course to be pursued, only those too old to walk, the sick and the foolish, being not called to the council. Very many different courses were proposed, and while these were being debated, a man rushed into the hall where the council was being held, and informed them that their enemy was coming, for he had himself seen him making his way to the town, bearing on his shoulders a stone almost big enough to bury the place under it. He reported that the devil was yet a long way off, for his load hampered him sadly, and he could not travel fast. What to do the councillors did not know, when suddenly there came amongst them a poor cobbler, with whom they had forgot to call to the meeting, for he was, indeed, looked upon as only half-witted. I will go and meet him, said he, and stop him coming here. You stop him, they all cried. It's mad that you must be thinking of it. I'll go all the same, said the cobbler, and without saying a word more, he goes out and begins to make ready for his journey. First of all, he collected together as many old boots and shoes as he could find, and when he'd got them all in a bundle, he finds out the man who had seen the devil coming on, and inquired of him the way he should go to meet him. The man told him the road, and the cobbler set out. He walked and walked and walked, till at last he came to the devil, he was sitting by the roadside, resting himself, and trying to get cool. For the day was warm, and he was nearly worn out with carrying the big rock which lay beside him. "'Do you know such and such a place?' he asks of the man, naming the town he would be at. "'I do indeed,' says the man, for I ought to, seeing I have lived in its neighbourhood these many years, and have only left there to travel here. "'And how many days have you been getting here? 
asked the devil anxiously, for he had hoped he was near the end of his journey. Old oh, days and days, replies the man. See here, and opens his bundle of old boots that he had ready. See here, says he. These are the boots I've worn out on the held road in coming from the place here. Have you indeed, says the devil, looking at them amazed, little thinking that the man was lying as he showed him a pair after pair, all in holes and shreds. Well, indeed, it must be a long way off. And he looks around him, and then at the rock, and thinks what a terrible long way he has to bring it, and begins to doubt whether, after all, since he's still got so far to go, it's worth all the trouble. If it had been near, says he, it would have been a different thing, and I would have shown them what it is to treat me as they did. But as it's so far off, it's another matter, and I don't think it's worth the trouble. So he just takes up the rock and flings it aside in a field, and goes off back again. So the cobbler came home and told all the townsfolk what he had done, and how he had cheated the devil. And I can assure you that they all admired his cleverness, and the joke of tricking the devil as he had, nor did they allow him to lose in consequence of missing his day's work. End of section 19section 20 of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jonathan paul arnold folklore and legends english by charles john tibbets section 20 the tavistock witch an old witch in days of yore lived in the neighborhood of tavistock and whenever she wanted money she would assume the shape of a hare and would send out her grandson to tell a certain huntsman who lived hard by that he had seen a hare sitting at such a particular spot for which he always received the reward of sixpence. After this deception had been practised many times, the dogs turned out and the hare pursued. Often seen but never caught, a sportsman of the party began to suspect that the devil was in the dance, and there would be no end to it. The matter was discussed, a justice consulted, and a clergyman to boot, and it was thought that however clever the devil might be, law and church combined would be more than a match for him. It was therefore agreed that, as the boy was singularly regular in the hour at which he came to announce the sight of a hare, all should be in readiness for a start. The instant such information was given, and a neighbour of the witch, nothing friendly to her, promised to let the parties know directly that the old woman and her grandson left the cottage and went off together, the one to be hunted and the other to set out on the hunt. The news came, the hounds were unkennelled, and huntsmen and sportsmen set off with surprising speed. The witch, now a hare, and her little colleague in iniquity, did not expect so very speedy a turnout, so that the game was pursued at a desperate rate, and the boy, forgetting himself in a moment of alarm, was heard to exclaim, Run, Granny, run, run for your life! At last the pursuers lost the hare, and she once more got safe into the cottage by a little hole in the bottom of the door but not large enough to admit a hound in chase. The huntsman and the squires, with their train, lent a hand to break open the door, but could not do it till the parson and the justice came up, but as law and church were certainly designed to break through iniquity, even so they did now succeed in bursting like magic bonds that opposed them. Upstairs they all went, then they found the old hag, bleeding and covered with wounds, and still out of breath. She denied she was a hare, and railed at the whole party. Call up the hounds, said the huntsman, and let us see what they take her to be. Maybe we may yet have another hunt. On hearing this, the old woman cried quarter. The boy dropped on his knees and begged hard for mercy. Mercy was granted on condition of its being received with a good whipping, and the huntsman, having long practised amongst the hounds, now tried his hands on their game. Thus the old woman escaped a worse fate for the time being. But on being afterwards put on trial for bewitching a young woman and making her spit pins, the above was given as evidence against her, and the old woman finished her days like a martyr at the stake. End of section 20. Section 21 of Folklore and Legends English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. The Worm of Lambton The young heir of Lambton led a dissolute and evil course of life, 
equally regardless of the obligations of his high estate and the sacred duties of religion according to his profane custom he was fishing on a sunday and threw his line into the river to catch fish at a time when all good men should have been engaged in the solemn observance of the day after having toiled in vain for some time he vented his disappointment at his ill success in curses loud and deep to the great scandal of all who heard him on their way to holy mass and to the manifest peril of his own soul at length he felt something extraordinary tugging at his line and in the hope of catching a large fish he drew it up with the utmost skill and care yet it required all his strength to bring the expected fish to land what was his surprise and mortification when instead of a fish he found that he had only caught a worm of most unseemly and disgusting appearance he hastily tore it from his hook and threw it into a well hard by he again threw in his line and continued to fish when a stranger of venerable appearance passing by asked him what sport to which he replied i think i've caught the devil and directed the inquirer to look into the well the stranger saw the worm and remarked that he had never seen the like of it before that it was like an eft but that it had nine holes on each side of its mouth and tokened no good the worm remained neglected in the well but soon grew so large that it became necessary to seek another abode it usually lay in the daytime coiled round a rock in the middle of the river and at night frequented a neighboring hill twining itself around the base and it continued to increase in length until it could lap itself three times around the hill it now became the terror of the neighborhood devouring lambs sucking the cow's milk and committing every species of injury on the cattle of the affrighted peasantry the immediate neighborhood was soon laid waste and the worm finding no further support on the north side of the river crossed the stream towards lambton hall where the old lord was then living in grief and sorrow the young heir of lambton having repented him of his former sins and gone to the wars in a far distant land the terrified household assembled in council and it was proposed by the steward a man far advanced in years and of great experience that the large trough which stood in the courtyard should be filled with milk the monster approached and eagerly drinking the milk returned without inflicting further injury to repose around its favorite hill the worm returned the next morning crossing the stream at the same hour and directing its way to the hall the quantity of milk to be provided was soon found to be the product of nine cows and if any portion short of this quantity was neglected or forgotten the worm showed the most violent signs of rage by lashing its tail around the trees in the park and tearing them up by the roots many a gallant knight of undoubted fame and prowess sought to slay this monster which was the terror of the whole countryside and it is related that in these mortal combats although the worm had been frequently cut asunder yet the several parts had immediately reunited and the valiant assailant never escaped without the loss of life or limb so that after many fruitless and fatal attempts to destroy the worm it remained at length in tranquil possession of its favorite hill all men fearing to encounter so deadly an enemy at length after seven long years the gallant heir of lambton returned from the wars of christendom and found the broad lands of his ancestors laid waste and desolate he heard the wailings of the people for their hearts were filled with terror and alarm he hastened to the hall of his ancestors and received the embraces of his aged father worn out with sorrow and grief 
both for the absence of his son whom he had considered dead and for the dreadful waste inflicted on his fair domain by the devastations of the worm he took no rest until he crossed the river to examine the worm as it lay coiled around the base of the hill and being a knight of tried valour and sound discretion and hearing the fate of all those who had fallen in the strife he consulted a sibyl on the best means to be pursued to slay the monster he was told that he himself had been the cause of all the misery which had been brought upon the country which increased his grief and strengthened his resolution he was also told that he must have his best suit of mail studded with spear blades and taking his stand on the rock in the middle of the river commend himself to providence and the might of his sword first making a solemn vow if successful to slay the first living thing he met or if he failed to do so the lords of lambton for nine generations would never die in their beds he made the solemn vow in the chapel of his forefathers and had his coat studded with the blades of the sharpest spears he took his stand on the rock in the middle of the river and unsheathing his trusty sword which had never failed him in time of need he commended himself to the will of providence at the accustomed hour the worm uncoiled its lengthened folds and leaving the hill took its usual course towards lambton hall and approached the rock where it sometimes reposed the knight nothing dismayed struck the monster on the head with all his might and main but without producing any other visible effect than irritating and vexing the worm which closing on the knight clasped its frightful coils around him and endeavoured to strangle him in its poisonous embrace the knight was however provided against this dangerous extremity for the more closely he was pressed by the worm the more deadly were the wounds inflicted by his coat of spear blades until the river ran with gore the strength of the worm diminished as its efforts increased to destroy the knight who seizing a favourable opportunity made such a good use of his sword that he cut the monster in two the severed part was immediately carried away by the current and the worm being thus unable to reunite itself was after a long and desperate conflict destroyed by the gallantry and courage of the knight of lambton the afflicted household were devoutly engaged in prayer during the combat but on the fortunate issue the knight according to promise blew a blast on his bugle to assure his father of his safety and that he might let loose his favourite hound which was destined to be the sacrifice the aged father forgetting everything but his parental feelings rushed forward to embrace his son when the knight beheld his father he was overwhelmed with grief he could not raise his arm against his parent but hoping that his vow might be accomplished and the curse averted by destroying the next living thing he met he blew another blast on his bugle his favourite hound broke loose and bounded to receive his caresses when the gallant knight with grief and reluctance once more drew his sword still reeking with the gore of the monster and plunged it into the heart of his faithful companion but in vain the prediction was fulfilled and the sibyl's curse pressed heavily on the house of lambton for nine generations end of section twenty one recording by linda johnson section twenty two of folklore and legends english this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arjun Anand. 
Folklore and Legends English by Charles John Tibbet The Old Woman and the Crooked Sixpence An old woman was sweeping her house and she found a crooked sixpence What says she shall I do with this sixpence I will go to the market and buy a pig with it She went and as she was coming home she came to a stile now the pig would not go over the stile the woman went on a little further and met a dog dog said she bite pig piggy won't go over the stile and i shall get home tonight but the dog would not bite the pig the woman went on a little further and she met a stick stick said she beat dog dog won't bite pig piggy won't go over stile and i shall get home tonight but the stick would not the woman went on a little further and she met a fire fire said she burn stick stick won't beat dog dog won't bite pig piggy won't go over the stile and i shall get home tonight but the fire would not The woman went on a little further and she met some water. Water said she, quench fire. Fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, etc. But the water would not. The woman went on a little further and she met an ox. Ox said she, drink water. Water won't quench fire, etc. But the ox would not. The woman went on again and she met a butcher. Butcher said she kill ox ox won't drink water etc but the butcher would not the woman went on a little further and met a rope rope said she hang butcher butcher won't kill ox etc but the rope would not again the woman went on and she met a rat rat said she gnaw rope rope won't hang butcher etc but the rat would not the woman went on a little further and met a cat cat said she kill rat rat won't gnaw rope etc oh said the cat i will kill the rat if you will fetch me a basin of milk from the cow over there the old woman went to the cow and asked her to let her have some milk for the cat no said the cow I will let you have no milk unless you bring me a mouthful of hay from yonder stack. Away went the old woman to the stack and fetched the hay and gave it to the cow. Then the cow gave her some milk and the old woman took it to the cat. When the cat had lapped the milk, the cat began to kill the rat. The rat began to gnaw the rope. The rope began to hang the butcher. The butcher began to kill the ox. The ox began to drink the water. The water began to quench the fire. The fire began to burn the stick. The stick began to beat the dog. The dog began to bite the pig. And Piggy, in a fright, jumped over the stile. And so, after all, the old woman got safe home that night. End of The Old Woman and the Crooked Sixpence Section 23 of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. Section 23. The Yorkshire Boggart. A boggart intruded himself upon what pretext or by what authority is unknown, into the house of a quiet, inoffensive, and laborious farmer. And when once it had taken possession, it disputed the right of domicile with the legal mortal tenant in a very unneighborly and arbitrary manner. In particular, it seemed to have a great aversion to children. As there is no point on which a parent feels more acutely than that of the maltreatment of his offspring the feelings of the father and more particularly of his good dame were daily ay and nightly harrowed up by the malice of this malignant and invisible boggart a boggart is seldom visible to the human eye 
though it is frequently seen by cattle particularly by horses and then they are said to take the boggle a yorkshireism for a shying horse the children's bread and butter would be snatched away or their porringers of bread and milk would be dashed down by an invisible hand, or if they were left alone for a few minutes, they were sure to be found screaming with terror on the return of the parents, like the farmer's children in the tale of the field of terror, whom the drudging goblin used to torment and frighten when he was left alone with them. The stairs led up from the kitchen. A partition of boards covered the ends of the steps and formed a closet beneath the staircase. A large round knot was accidentally displaced from one of the boards of this partition. One day the farmer's youngest boy was playing with the shoehorn, and as children will do, he stuck the horn into this knot hole. Whether the aperture had been found by the boggart as a peephole to watch the motions of the family, or whether he wished to amuse himself is uncertain but sure it is the horn was thrown back with surprising precision at the head of the child it was found that as often as the horn was replaced in the hole so surely it was ejected with a straight aim at the offender's head time at length made familiar this wonderful occurrence and that which at the first was regarded with terror became at length a kind of amusement within the more thoughtless and daring of the family. Often was the horn slipped slyly into the hole, and the boggart never failed to dart it out at the head of one or the other, but most commonly he or she who placed it there was the mark at which the invisible foe launched the offending horn. They used to call this, in their provincial dialect, lachen with boggart, i.e., playing with the boggart as if enraged at these liberties taken with his boggartship the goblin commenced a series of night disturbances heavy steps as of a person in wooden clogs were often heard clattering down the stairs in the dead hour of darkness and the pewter and earthen dishes appeared to be dashed on the kitchen floor though in the morning all were found uninjured on their respective shelves the children were chiefly marked out as objects of dislike by their unearthly tormentor the curtains of their beds would be violently pulled backward and forward anon a heavy weight as of a human being would press them nearly to suffocation they would then scream out for the daddy and mommy who occupied the adjoining room and thus the whole family was disturbed night after night things could not long go on after this fashion the farmer and his good dame resolved to leave the place where they had not the least shadow of rest or comfort the farmer whose name was george gilbertson was following with his wife and family the last load of furniture when they met a neighboring farmer whose name was john marshall between whom and the unhappy tenant the following colloquy took place well george and so you're leaving to old hoose at last hi johnny my lad i'm forced till it for that boggart torments us so we can neither rest neat nor day for it it seems like to have such a malice against poor bairns it almost kills my poor dame here at thoughts on it and so you see we're forced to flit like he had got thus far in his complaint when behold a shrill voice from a deep upright churn called out ay ay george we're flitting you see confound thee says the poor farmer if i'd known thou'd been there i hadn't a stirred a peg nay nay it's no use mally turning to his wife we might as well turn back again to old house as he tormented in another that's not so convenient they are said to have turned back but the boggart and they afterwards came to a better understanding though it long continued its trick of shooting the horn from the knot hole. End of section 23section 24 of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. The Durger. The following encounters with the Durger, a species of mischievous elves, are said to have taken place on Simonside Hills, a mountainous district between Rothbury and Elsdon in Northumberland. A person well acquainted with the locality went out one night to amuse himself with the pranks of these mysterious beings. When he had wandered a considerable time, he shouted loudly, Tint! Tint! and a light appeared before him like a burning candle in the window of a shepherd's cottage. Thither, with great caution, he bent his steps and speedily approached a deep slough, from whence a quantity of moss or peat had been excavated, and which was now filled with mud and water. Into this he threw a piece of turf which he raised at his feet, and when the sound of the splash echoed throughout the surrounding stillness, the decoying light was extinguished. The adventurer retraced his steps, overjoyed at his dexterity in outwitting the fiendish imps, and, in a moment of exultation, as if he held all the powers of darkness in defiance, he again cried to the full extent of his voice, Tint! Tint! His egotism subsided, however, more quickly than it arose, when he observed three of the little demons, with hideous visages, approach him, carrying torches in their diminutive hands, as if they wished to inspect the figure of their enemy. He now betook himself to the speed of his heels for safety, but found that an innumerable multitude of the same species were gathering round him, each with a torch in one hand and a short club in the other which they brandished with such gestures as if they were resolved to oppose his flight and drive him back into the morass. Like a knight of romance, he charged with his oaken staff the foremost of his foes, striking them, as it seemed, to the earth, for they disappeared. But his offensive weapon encountered in its descent no substance of flesh or bone and beyond its sweep the demons appeared to augment both in size and number on witnessing so much of the unearthly his heart failed him he sank down in a state of stupor nor was he himself again till the grey light of the morning dispersed his unhallowed opponents and revealed before him the direct way to his own dwelling another time a traveller, wandering over these mountain solitudes, had the misfortune to be benighted, and, perceiving near him a glimmering light, he hastened thither and found what appeared to be a hut, on the floor of which, between two rough grey stones, the embers of a fire, which had been supplied with wood, were still glowing and unconsumed. He entered, and the impression on his mind was that the place had been deserted an hour or two previously by gypsies, for on one side lay a couple of old gate-posts ready to be split up for fuel, and a quantity of refuse brushwood, such as is left from besom making was strewn upon the floor. With this material he trimmed the fire and had just seated himself on one of the stones, when a diminutive figure in human shape not higher than his knee, came waddling in at the door, and took possession of the other. The traveller, being acquainted with the manner in which things of this description ought to be regarded, retained his self-possession, kept his seat, and remained silent, knowing that if he rose up or spoke, his danger would be redoubled. And as the flame blazed up, he examined minutely the hollow eyes, the stern, vindictive features, and the short, strong limbs of the visitor before him. By degrees he perceived that the hut afforded little or no shelter from the cold night air, and as the energy of the fire subsided, he lifted from the floor a piece of wood, broke it over his knee, 
and laid the fragments upon the red-hot embers whether this operation was regarded by his strange neighbor as a species of insult we cannot say but the demon seized as if in bitter mockery one of the gate-posts broke it likewise over its knee and laid the pieces on the embers in the same manner the other having no wish to witness a further display of such marvellous agency thenceforth permitted the fire to die away and kept his position in darkness and silence till the fair dawn of returning day made him aware of the extreme danger to which he was exposed he saw a quantity of white ashes before him but the grim dwarfish intruder with the roof and walls of the hut were gone and he himself sat upon a stone sure enough but it formed one of the points of a deep rugged precipice over which the slightest inadvertent movement had been the means of dashing him to pieces end of section twenty four recording by linda johnson section twenty five of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org folklore and legends english by charles john tibbets the barn elves an honest hampshire farmer was sore distressed by the nightly unsettling of his barn however straightly overnight he laid his sheaves on the threshing floor for the application of the morning's flail when morning came all was topsy-turvy higgledy-piggledy though the door remained locked and there was no sign whatever of irregular entry resolved to find out who played him these mischievous pranks hodge couched himself one night deeply among the sheaves and watched for the enemy at length midnight arrived the barn was illuminated as if by moonbeams of wonderful brightness and through the keyhole came thousands of elves the most diminutive that could be imagined they immediately began their gambols among the straw which was soon in the most admired disorder hodge wondered but interfered not but at last the supernatural thieves began to busy themselves in a way still less to his taste for each elf set about conveying the crop away a straw at a time with astonishing activity and perseverance the keyhole was still their port of egress and regress and it resembled the aperture of a beehive on a sunny day in june the farmer was rather annoyed at seeing his grain vanish in this fashion when one of the fairies while hard at work said to another in the tiniest voice that ever was heard i wet you wet i sweat do you sweat hodge could contain himself no longer he leapt out crying the deuce sweat ye let me get among ye the fairies all flew away so frightened that they never disturbed the barn any more End of section twenty five recording by linda johnson section twenty six of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org folklore and legends english by charles john tibbets section twenty six legends of king arthur immemorial tradition has asserted that king arthur his queen guinevere court of lords and ladies and his hounds were enchanted in some cave of the crags or in a hall below the castle of sewing shields and would continue entranced there till some one should first blow a bugle-horn that lay on a table near the entrance into the hall and then with the sword of stone cut a garter 
also placed there beside it but none had ever heard where the entrance to this enchanted hall was till a farmer at sewing shields about fifty years since was sitting knitting on the ruins of the castle and his clue fell and ran downwards through a bush of briars and nettles as he supposed into a deep subterranean passage full in the faith that the entrance into king arthur's hall was now discovered he cleared the briery portal of its weeds and rubbish and entering a vaulted passage followed in his darkling way the web of his clue the floor was infested with toads and lizards and the dark wings of bats disturbed by his unhallowed intrusion flitted fearfully around him at length his sinking faith was strengthened by a dim distant light which as he advanced grew gradually lighter till all at once he entered a vast and vaulted hall in the centre of which a fire without fuel from a broad crevice in the floor blazed with a high and lambent flame that showed all the carved walls and fretted roof and the monarch and his queen and court reposing around in a theatre of thrones and costly couches on the floor beyond the fire lay the faithful and deep-toned pack of thirty couple of hounds and on the table before it the spell dissolving horn sword and garter the farmer reverently but firmly grasped the sword and as he drew it leisurely from its rusty scabbard the eyes of the monarch and his courtiers began to open and they rose till they sat upright he cut the garter and as the sword was being slowly sheathed the spell assumed its ancient power and they all gradually sank to rest but not before the monarch lifted up his eyes and hands and exclaimed oh woe betide that evil day on which this witless wight was born who drew the sword the garter cut but never blew the bugle horn of this favorite tradition the most remarkable variation is respecting the place where the farmer descended some say that after the king's denunciation terror brought on loss of memory and the farmer was unable to give any correct account of his adventure or the place where it occurred all agree that mrs spearman the wife of another and more recent occupier of the estate had a dream in which she saw a rich hoard of treasure among the ruins of the castle and that for many days together she stood over workmen employed in searching for it but without success another version of the story has less of the pomp of the sceptred state than the preceding and is evidently sprung from a baser original but its verity is not the less to be depended upon a shepherd one day in quest of a strayed sheep on the crags had his attention aroused by the scene around him assuming an appearance he had never before witnessed there seemed to be about it a more than wanted vividness and such a deep solemnity hung over its aspect that its features became as it were palpably impressed upon his mind while he was musing upon this unexpected occurrence his steps were arrested by a ball of thread this he laid hold of and pursuing the path it pointed out found it led into a cavern in the recesses of which as the guiding line used by miners in their explorations of devious passages it appeared to lose itself as he approached he felt perforce constrained to follow the strange conductor that had so marvelously come into his hands after passing through a long and dreary vestibule he entered into an apartment in the interior an immense fire blazed on the hearth and cast its broad flashes with a wild unearthly glare to the remotest corner of the chamber over it was placed a huge cauldron as if preparations were being made for a feast on an extensive scale two hounds lay couchant on either side of the fireplace in the stillness of unbroken slumber the only remarkable piece of furniture in the apartment was a table covered with green cloth at the head of the table a being considerably advanced in years of a dignified mien and clad in the habiliments of war 
sat as it were fast asleep in an armchair at the other end of the table lay a horn and a sword notwithstanding these signs of life there prevailed a dead silence throughout the chamber the very feeling of which made the shepherd reflect that he had advanced far beyond the limits of human experience and that he was now in the presence of objects that belonged more to death than to life the very idea made his flesh creep he however had sufficient fortitude to advance to the table and lift the horn the hounds pricked up their ears most fearfully and the grisly veteran started up on his elbow and raising his half unwilling eyes told the staggered hind that if he would blow the horn and draw the sword he would confer upon him the honours of knighthood to last through time such unheard-of dignities from a source so ghastly either met with no appreciation from the awe-stricken swain or the terror of finding himself alone in the company it might be of malignant phantoms who were only tempting him to his ruin became too urgent to be resisted and therefore proposing to divide the peril with a comrade he groped his darkling way as best his quaking limbs could support him back to the blessed daylight on his return with a reinforcement of strength and courage all traces of the former scene had disappeared the crags presented their usual cheerful and quiet aspect and every vestige of the opening of a cavern was obliterated thus failed another of the repeated opportunities for releasing the spell-bound king of britain from the charmed sleep of ages within his rocky chamber he still sleeps on as tradition tells till the appointed hour or if invited by his enchantress to participate in the illusions of the fairy festival it has charms for him no longer wasted with care he sits beside her the banquet untasted the pageantry unmasked by constraint her guest and from his native land withheld by sad necessity End of section 26section twenty seven of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org folklore and legends english by charles john tibbets silky about the commencement of the present century the inhabitants of the quiet village of blackheadon near stamfordham and all of its vicinity who lived as most of the villagers do with all possible harmony amongst themselves and relishing no more external disturbance than was consistent with their gentle and sequestered mode of existence were dreadfully annoyed by the pranks of a preternatural being called silky this name it had obtained from its manifesting a marked predilection to make itself visible in the semblance of a female dressed in silk many a time when one of the more timorous of the community had a night journey to perform have they unawares and invisibly been dogged and watched by this spectral tormentor who at the dreariest part of the road the most suitable for thrilling surprises would suddenly break forth in dazzling splendour if the person happened to be on horseback a sort of exercise for which she evinced a strong partiality she would unexpectedly seat herself behind rattling in her silks there after enjoying a comfortable ride with instantaneous abruptness she would like a thing destitute of continuity dissolve away and become incorporate with the nocturnal shades leaving the bewildered horseman in blank amazement at belsay some two or three miles from blackheadon she had a favourite resort this was a romantic crag finely studded with trees under the gloomy umbrage of which like one forlorn she loved to wander 
all the livelong night. Here, often, has the belated peasant, with awe-stricken vision, beheld her dimly through the sombre twilight, as if engaged in splitting great stones, or hewing with many a repeated stroke some stately monarch of the grove. While he thus stood and gazed, and listened to intimations, impossible to be misapprehended, of the dread reality of that mysterious being, concerning whom so various conjunctures were awake, all at once, excited by that wondrous agency, he would hear the howling of a restless tempest rushing through the woodland, the branches creaking in violent concussion, or rent into pieces by the impetuous fury of the blast, while, to the eye, not a leaf was seen to quiver, or a pensile spray to bend. The bottom of this crag is washed by a picturesque lake or fish pond, at whose outlet is a waterfall over which a venerable tree, sweeping its leafy arms, adds impressiveness to the scene. Amid the complicated and contorted limbs of this tree, Silky possessed a rude chair, where she was wont, in her moody moments, to sit, wind-rocked, enjoying the rustling of the storm in the dark woods or the gush of the cascade. The tree, so consecrated in the sympathies and terrors of the people of the vicinity, has been reserved. Though now, 1842, no longer tenanted by its aerial visitant, it yet spreads majestically its time-hallowed canopy over the spot, awakening in the love-first rustic, when the winter's wind waves gusty and sonorous through its leafless boughs the sole harrowing recollection of the exploits of the ancient fay. But in the springtime, beautiful with the full-flushed verdure of that exuberant season, recipient of the kindling emotions of reverence of affection, it still bears the name of Silky's seat, in memory of its once wonderful occupant. Silky, exercised a marvellous influence over the brute creation. Horses, which indisputably possess a discernment of spirits superior to that of man, and are more sharp-sighted in the dark, were in an extraordinary degree sensitive of her presence and control. Having once perceived the effects of her power, she seems to have had a perverse pleasure in meddling with and arresting those poor defenceless animals, while engaged in the most exemplary performance of their labours. When this misfortune occurred, there was no remedy that brute force could devise. Expostulation, soothing, whipping, and kicking were all exerted in vain to make the restive beast resume the proper and intended direction. The ultimate resource unless it be the whim of Silky to revoke the spell, was the magic-dispelling witchwood, which, it is satisfactory to learn, was of unfailing efficacy. One poor white, a farm servant, was once the selected victim of her mischievous frolics. He had to go to a colliery at some distance, for coals, and it was late in the evening before he could return. Silky, with spirit-like prescience, having intimation of the circumstance, waylaid him at a bridge, a ghastly, ghost-alluring edifice, since called Silky's Brig. Lying a little to the south of Blackheadon, on the road between that place and Stamfordham. Just as he had arrived at the height of that bad eminence, the keystone, horses, and cart became fixed and immovable as fate. In that melancholy plight might both man and horses have continued, quaking and sweating and paralysed, till the morning light had thrown around them its mantle of protection. Had not a neighbour's servant come to the rescue, who opportunely carried some of the potent witchwood, mountain ash, about his person? 
on arrival of this seasonable aid the perplexed driver rallied his scattered senses and the helpless animals being duly seasoned after the fashion prescribed on such occasions he had the heartfelt satisfaction of seeing them apply themselves with the customary alacrity to the draught the charm was effectually overcome and in a short time both the man and the coals reached home in safety ever afterwards however as long as he lived he took the precaution of rendering himself spell-proof by being furnished with a sufficient quantity of witchwood being by no means disposed that silky should a second time amuse herself at his expense and that of his team she was wayward and capricious sometimes she installed herself in the office of that old familiar la brownie but with characteristic misdirection in a manner exactly the reverse of that useful species of hobgoblin here it may be remarked that throughout her disembodied career she can scarcely be said to have performed one benevolent action for the sake of its moral qualities she had from first to last a perpetual latent hankering for mischief and gloried in withering surprises and unforeseen movements as is customary with that sturdy fairy as she is designated by the great english lexicographer her works were performed at night or between the hours of sunset and day dawn if the good old dames had thoroughly cleaned their houses which country people make a practice of doing especially on saturdays so that they may have a comfortable and decent appearance on the sabbath day after they have retired to rest silky would silently turn everything topsy-turvy and the morning presented a scene of indescribable confusion on the contrary if the house had been left in a disorderly state a plan which the folk generally find it best to adopt everything would be arranged with the greatest nicety at length a term had arrived to her erratic course and both she and the peaceably disposed inhabitants whom she disquieted obtained the repose so long mutually desired she abruptly disappeared it has long been surmised by those who paid attention to those dark matters that she was the troubled phantom of some person who had died very miserable in consequence of having great treasure which before being taken by her mortal agony had not been disclosed and on that account silky could not rest in her grave about the period referred to a domestic female servant being alone in one of the rooms of a house in black Heddon, was frightfully alarmed by the ceiling above suddenly giving way and from it there dropped with a prodigious clash something quite black shapeless and uncouth the servant did not stop to scrutinize an object so hideous and startling but fled to her mistress screaming at the pitch of her voice the devil's in the house the devil's in the house he's come through the ceiling with this terrible announcement the whole family was speedily convoked and great was the consternation at the idea of the foe of mankind being amongst them in visible form in this appalling extremity a considerable time elapsed before any one could brace up the courage to face the enemy or be prevailed on to go and inspect the cause of their alarm at last the mistress who chanced to be the most stout-hearted ventured into the room when instead of the personage on account of whom such awful apprehensions were entertained a great dog or calf-skin lay on the floor sufficiently black and uncomely but filled with gold after this silky was never more heard of after this silky was never more heard or seen her destiny was accomplished her spirit laid and now she sleeps with her ancestors 
End of section 27 End of Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets.